each and every one of you. I hope you all had a good day yesterday, the new year, and uh, good to be able to be in the house of the Lord on this the second day. Um, looks like we're going to be a little gloomy this morning, but I see the sun's trying to peek out now, so that's that's good to see. Uh, this morning, if you would, if you'll take your hymnals, your red hymnal, turn to hymn number 245. 245 at Calvary. If you would please stand as we sing all four stanzas. <laughs> morning and a joy to welcome you to this time of worship and uh, we do have folks out sick today and so we want to live we want to pray for them that they'll feel better soon and so but glad you're here today as we gather to worship the Lord and praise his holy name will you bow with me in prayer father we just give you thanks and praise for the day with which you blessed us thank you for the opportunity to come into this place and worship you Thank you for the opportunity to come and celebrate who you are. Well, thank you for this opportunity at the beginning of a new year when we can gather and worship you freely. And Father, we just thank you for living in this great nation where we have this freedom. May we never take it for granted, Lord, and may we, may we always seek to protect it. Father, thank you so much for the gift of, of worship. And as we continue to worship you, may we experience your presence in a rich and powerful way. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, as we continue singing this morning, hymn number 230. Hymn 230, the old rugged cross. And I'll let you remain seated. All four stanzas. <laughs> Oh, 
right. And a mommy too, please. Happy New Year. I'm glad to see everybody. Can you turn this way so I can see your face? Oh, I like that so good. I like your handsome this morning with that tie on. Liam, I like that. You know, when I walked in the worship center this morning, when I got here and I saw this beautiful table set for the Lord's Supper, I got so excited. And I want to tell you how excited I was when I was a little girl. When I was a little girl, we had the Lord's Supper. The deacons took turns setting it up. They do it today, but they do it at the church. But they did it at home. During the week, my dad would come to the church and get the, the setup, and we would set it up at home. Now, my parents would talk about what this meant. And we actually had glass cups. And uh, they passed a tray that had broken crackers in it, saltines. Whoops, got a red blood, red bow there. Let's get rid of that, we don't need that today. Um, but today, because of COVID, we have to do things differently. But it still means the same. I wanted you to see a cup up close. This is the grape juice, and right under that lid is the cracker or the wafer. <coughs> And it's, does, it doesn't taste like a cracker. It tastes like flour. But you know, it's not what it tastes like that makes the difference. It's what it means. What it means is Jesus took this when he was with his disciples in what's called the Last Supper. And he told them, he said, I'm going to take this bread. And it was unleavened bread, so it wasn't fluffy like you and I like our rolls. But it was kind of crusty. And he broke it and he said, I want you to take this. And when you do, I want you to remember about my death and how my body was broken. And then he took the cup of fruit juice and he said, and I want you to remember when you take of the juice that that was the blood I shed just for you, each one of you each one of you out there. And he said, this is to show that I'm going to go and sacrifice myself so that you will have salvation. Oh, that's a big word, isn't it? It is. It means free from death. Wow. So when we believe that Jesus died for us and we invite him into our lives, we partake of the Lord's Supper with great meaning. Now, I'm going to tell you a funny thing that I did as a little girl about your age. When my parents brought the Lord's Supper elements home, there was always some grape juice left. And there was always some crackers left. Because they wanted to have enough for everybody. So when they would get home and my mother would place it in the kitchen, so that she could clean it all up. I didn't wait until she poured the grape juice into a glass for me to drink. I went in, I took a cup and I drank it. And I said, Jesus died for me. I, I was beginning to understand. And even though we as boys and girls don't get to do that today, after the Lord's Supper, we can think about it as we see this. I would take it apart, but it's just, a little bit messy, so let's do it, okay? But I wanted you to see it. And this is what we, why we do this so often, is to remember that Jesus died on the cross for all of us. I'm glad that you're here today. And I hope you had a happy new year. Do you feel any older? You do? Okay, good. Well, let's thank God for the new year and for this wonderful supper that he provides so that we can remember about him. Would you pray with me? 
Father God, we thank you so much for this day as a new year dawns on us and we begin to live for you in 2022. I thank you for these boys and girls and for parents who see a need to be in church. I thank you for this supper that we share to remember just what you did on the cross for each of us. And I hope that as boys and girls think about this, that as your heart, you, you lead their hearts, they too will one day invite Jesus into their lives. Father, we love you, we praise you, and we thank you most of all for your son, Jesus Christ, who died for us all. It's in his name I pray. Amen. Now, let's return to our families.
Thank you, Gina. As we partake of the Lord's Supper, what a wonderful reminder that Jesus paid it all. <clears throat> Will you bow with me in prayer? Father, we give you thanks, we give you praise. That Jesus, our Lord and Savior, paid it all. He went to the cross. His body was beaten and broken. His blood was spilled all for our sins. He who knew no sin became sin for us. And Father, we celebrate that this morning by partaking of the juice and the bread. To remind us of the, of, the, of the shed blood and the broken body of Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Matthew chapter 26, again in reading in verse 26, it says, Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. So we eat the bread to remind us of his broken body. And we drink the juice to remind us of his shed blood for our sins. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We praise you. For this very simple time of remembrance. But oh, how powerful it is as we 
partake of the bread. We are reminded of your broken body that you willingly allowed to be broken. You surrendered yourself. We remember your shed blood that you willingly shed for us, for everyone, so that our sins could be forgiven. Father, we give you praise. We give you glory. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <coughs> have your Bibles this morning, I invite you to turn to 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 through 21. Every year, as the calendar changes, changes from December to January, people are, are filled with hope. They feel with hope that the, the new year will bring better days. And for many people to do their part in bringing about these better days, many people make New Year's resolutions. People will resolve to begin to do or to quit doing all kinds of things that they believe will make their life better. The problem, there's a problem with that though. The problem is that our commitment to these New Year's resolutions does not usually last very long at all. I can give you a, an example. Every year at this time, many people make a resolution that they're going to exercise, they're going to lose weight, they're going to get in better health. And so what they do, they go and join a gym. Now, if you're a member of a gym or go to a gym, you see this happen every year. In January, the treadmill or the exercise bike that you always use, you no longer can get on because all these people who made New Year's resolutions to get in better shape have flocked to the gym and they've taken over your equipment. And let's be honest, it ticks you off, doesn't it? But you know something that they haven't realized yet. You, what you know is, give them a few weeks. Come February, March at the latest, and you'll have your treadmill or your exercise bike right back because the gym will be semi-empty again. Why? Because New Year's resolutions, let's be honest, they don't last long. They don't last long. The truth is that the changing of the calendar from one year to the next does not magically change us or change life. We need so much more, so much more than a New Year's resolution to transform our lives. We need to be transformed into a new person, a new creation. We need so much more than just a, a new gym membership or whatever it may be to change what we want to change. We need to be transformed into, to use a biblical term, a new creation. And the reality is that such a transformation can only take place through a personal saving relationship with Jesus Christ. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 through 21, the Apostle Paul wrote, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, 
not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God, making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Now, this is great news. This is great news. Because in Christ, no one needs to stay the same because Jesus has the power to transform our lives to make us a new creation. That verse 17, look at it again. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Now the Apostle Paul makes this, this, this great statement, this great truth in the context of telling us of the reconciling work of Christ. But what does it mean to be reconciled? To be reconciled means that two things that were separated have been brought together. Reconciliation, now here's the key. Reconciliation with God is every person's need. It's their basic need, whether they realize it or not. They can be lost as lost can be, have no idea who God is, not care anything about God or the church, but reconciliation with God is their basic need. <clears throat> and until they or we are at peace with God, we cannot be at peace with ourselves or at peace with anyone else. Until we're at peace with God, we cannot be a new creation. Folks can make all kind of New Year's resolutions about what a better person they're going to be, what a better year it's going to be, but unless they surrender it all to Jesus and lay it at his feet, by January or end of January or February, those resolutions will be by the wayside. You see, the heart of the gospel is this, and it's found in verse 19. In Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. It is through reconciliation to God, through Christ, that our lives are truly transformed, that we are a new creation. Now this morning, as we look at this passage, I want you to notice four aspects of this transforming work of Christ. The first is this, it's the, it's the broad application, the broad application. The scripture says, if anyone, anyone is in Christ. In other words, God excludes no one from the transforming work of Christ. It doesn't matter what anyone's done in their life. No one is excluded. If they're willing to come to Christ and surrender to him, no one is excluded he says, if anyone. We just finished with Christmas, and I thought I'd pull Christmas back in here for a minute. You remember that the angel who announced the birth of Christ to the shepherds? Remember what that angel said? First of all, he said, fear not. For behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for who? Be for who? For all the people. For all the people. All over the world, this this Savior has been born. He is Christ the Lord. And he's not just for this group or that group. He is for all the people. Do you remember what Jesus said at the end of Matthew in the Great Commission? Go therefore and make disciples of who? Of all nations. Not some nations. Not just our favorite nations, but of all nations, of all peoples. In Mark chapter 16, verse 15, Jesus said, go into where? All the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. This transforming work of Christ is for everyone, all people, all nations, all the world. And for everyone who surrenders to Christ, Christ truly transforms them and makes them into a new creation. You want to see evidence of that? Well, 
For most of us, we just can look in the mirror, can't we? We are a new creation. If we've surrendered to Christ, we're a new creation. Let me give you a biblical example. Paul writing to the church there in Corinth in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 11. He lays down some hard teaching here about who, who is excluded from the kingdom of God. But then in verse 11, he reminds his Christian readers of something. He begins, says, do you, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And as he writes these people there in Corinth who are now Christians, we might assume that what Paul says next is, be thankful you have never been one of those. But that's not what he says. Verse 11, and say, he says, And such were some of you. Such were some of you. Some of you were, were in the sexual immorality, he's saying. Some of you were idolaters. Some of you were adulterers. Some of you practiced homosexuality. Some of you were thieves. Some of you were greedy. Some of you were drunkards or revilers. Some of you were swindlers. He says, such were some of you. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. You see, the reality is no one's past excludes them from coming to Christ and being transformed by him. No one's past precludes them from coming to Christ and surrendering to him and him making them a new creation. The life transforming work of Christ is available to anyone and everyone. That leads us to the second point. And that this is the specific limitation. The specific limitation. He says, if anyone is in Christ, anyone can come to Christ, but Christ is the only way to becoming a new creation. Everyone can come to Christ, but Christ is the only way to salvation. There's only one way to experience this transformation that God offers, and that is in Christ. There is only one way to become a new creation that is in Christ. The Bible does not say if anyone is active in church. It says if anyone is in Christ. The Bible does not say if anyone is a good person. The Bible says if anyone is in Christ. The Bible doesn't even say if anyone is religious. The Bible says if anyone is in Christ. The world of, of, of the Apostle Paul's day, like the world of our day, was filled with a variety of religions. The world's religions might help us transform our actions momentarily, but they do not have the power to transform and clean a sinful heart. A personal resolve, a resolution, might make a positive change in our life and our own strength can make a difference for, for just a short while. But sooner or later, what happens? Our sin nature will take over and we'll go back to our old self. Only a personal saving relationship with Jesus Christ can transform our sinful heart. Jesus came to earth to save us from our sins. Jesus is the only solution to our sin problem. So while the life transforming work of Christ is available to anyone, it's available to everyone, it is only through Christ that we can truly be transformed and become a new creation. That leads us to the third point, and that is a, a gr the grand implication the grand implication, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Then, 
And then he goes on and says, the old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Only in Christ can we become a new creation. No one, nothing else can transform us and make us new like Jesus Christ. Think about it. When, when you came to Christ, those things that were important to you before Christ are no longer important to you. When we are in Christ, he transforms our thoughts, our desires, our values, our priorities. He transforms everything about us. But how does this transformation take place? Look at verse 21. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. For our sake, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him, the one who became sin for us, we become the righteousness of God. We are a new creation all because of the transforming work of Jesus Christ. We are a new creation all because Jesus Christ, the perfect Lamb of God, took our sins, died in our place on the cross. We're a new creation once we surrender to Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And His Holy Spirit comes to live within us and transforms us to become more and more like Jesus. And this is not something that can happen if we just dedicate ourselves to a few New Year's resolutions. This is not something that can happen if we just decide, I'm going to be a better person. I'm going to quit doing these things. I'm going to start doing these things. This can only happen through the power and presence of the Lord working within us. And once Christ transforms us, think about this. Once he transforms us, once we are made new, we're not just a better version of our old self. We're a new creation. We're a new creation. That leads us to the last point. And that is the great dedication Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. The Lord does not make us a new creation just so we can feel better about ourselves. He doesn't make us a new creation just so we can say, man, I'm glad I'm not what I used to be. He doesn't make us a new creation just so we can look at other people and say, man, I'm glad I'm better than them. The Lord makes us a new creation so that we will be his ambassadors. Now, what is an ambassador? An ambassador served as a representative of the king from one country to another. Our nation now has ambassadors all over the world. Other nations have ambassadors here, and they represent their country's interests in those foreign countries. So as ambassadors for Christ, we are messengers. We're on mission, representing the King of kings and the Lord of lords, pleading with the people of the world to be reconciled to God. You and I are the vessels that God uses to share the good news of Jesus Christ with a lost and dying world. And friends, we're living in a time today when the world desperately needs to hear the gospel. We're living in a time more than any other time when lives are broken, families are broken, people are discouraged, and people desperately need to hear the good news that only Jesus can bring. Only Jesus can forgive us of our sins. Only Jesus can transform our lives. Only Jesus can make us a new creation. Therefore, we're called to be ambassadors. 
Therefore, we must proclaim this message of reconciliation. Without Christ, everybody is separated from God by sin. But there's hope. There's hope. God is the author. He's the originator of reconciliation. Verse 18 says, All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. He, he reconciled us. He transformed us. He made us into a new creation. And then he gave us the ministry of reconciliation. But notice he gave us the message, the ministry of reconciliation. We don't have the ability to reconcile people to God. Only Christ can reconcile people to, to God. Christ alone provides the way of reconciliation to God. Look at verse 19. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Because Christ alone accomplished the work of reconciliation. Go back to that verse 21. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. In other words, Christ took what was ours, our sin, and gave us what was his, his perfect righteousness. <clears throat> and as a result, therefore, in verse 20, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. And what's at stake as we go out with the, with the message of reconciliation, the, the ministry of reconciliation, what's at stake? That what's at stake is found in verse 17. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And that new comes that old passes away and that new comes not because a, challenger can't cha a calendar change from one year to the next. It comes because Jesus Christ is invited into a person's life to be their Savior and Lord and then he transforms them into a new creation. Our world is filled. Our community is filled. My neighborhood, your neighborhood is filled with people whose lives are broken and shattered by sin. And they look for anything and everything for meaning and purpose in their life. Some of them this weekend looked to New Year's resolution. <coughs> they were going to make the, they just knew that this weekend they're going to make the, the right New Year's resolution and they're going to stick to it and everything's going to change for them. The bad news is that won't cut it. The good news is we know a Savior. We are his ambassadors. And it's our purpose, our mission to tell them that in a personal relationship with Christ, their life can be transformed and they can be a new creation. That doesn't mean all their problems go away. But what it does mean is someone's there to walk with them through those problems and give them strength and give them meaning and give them purpose and give them an eternal home when their life here on earth is over. So as we begin this new year, let's not look to the change of the calendar for the change that be, needs to be made in my life and in your life. Let's look to Jesus the ultimate transformer, the one who can make us a new creation. And let's commit ourselves to be his ambassadors because the world desperately, desperately needs to hear the good news that only Jesus brings. Let's, let's commit ourselves to be ambassadors for Christ, not just today, not just this month, not just this year, 
but for every day and with every breath we have left on this earth. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you and we praise you for this day that you've given us, for this new beginning of a new year you've given us. But Father, help us to understand and to realize that a true new beginning only begins in Jesus Christ. He can, Jesus can transform our life. He can make us a new creation. And Father, if we've already surrendered to Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, then we have a responsibility. We have a mission. We have a message of, of, of being ambassadors for Christ, of being on mission to, to being ministers of reconciliation, to pointing people to Jesus telling people what Jesus has done in our life and what he's done in our life he can do in theirs if we simply trust him and they simply trust him. Father, we thank you and we praise you and as we sing this hymn of dedication, Lord, if there's anyone who needs to come forward and bow on their knees at this altar or, 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 or needs to be prayed with, whatever our needs may be, Father, may we surrender to you in these moments. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. That's the hymn. 256. Two, the hymn is 256. 256. As we stand and as we sing, if you need to respond publicly, won't you come?